Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Hello and welcome to the ID the Future podcast. I'm Casey Luskin, broadcasting from Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. And today on the show we have with us Dr. Robert J. Marks, Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. And we have Dr. Marks with us to discuss a paper he recently published in Proceedings of the 2009 IEEE International Conference on Systems Man and Cybernetics with William Dembski. So Dr. Marks, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us today. Oh, thanks, Casey. It's good to, good to talk to you. Well, uh, Dr. Marks, it's, it's been a while since we last spoke. And last time our conversation got you into a little bit of trouble, um, yes. I believe that your <laughs> university actually shut down your ProID website. So if you don't mind me asking, how are things going for you at Baylor these days? Well, a- actually, thanks for asking. Uh, they're going really great. I-, I continue with my work in evolutionary informatics and in the other areas in which I'm involved in research. And since I'm asked a lot, let me just say that uh, Baylor, where I work, is a very unique and it's a, it's a wonderful place. I came there because it was wonderful. It has uh, Southern Baptist roots, and Baylor is on the way to becoming the world's uh, premier research institution that celebrates a Christian worldview. All the faculty hired at Baylor must be practicing Christians. As a result of this, Baylor has a lot of world-class faculty doing um, cutting-edge research who really care about and mentor their students. Uh, For example, I tell people I'm here. That's great. But Dr. Marks, did Baylor ever apologize to you for that incident where they took down your ProID website about your research? Uh, No, they haven't. Well, do you think that they're going to do that? Um, that would be nice. Okay. So what was the ultimate fate of your, your website? You have put it on a third-party server, I believe. Is that right? Yes, it's on a third-party server. It's at the evoinfo.org, E-V-O-I-N-F-O.org, and all of uh, our work and papers are posted there. A lot of our listeners may not know some of the details of what happened to you. Many of them who actually watched Expelled have probably heard about your story before, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that right now. We've covered it before on Evolution News and Views, and Expelled covers it. But what has been the impact, I guess, to your work and your research as a result of how Baylor did pull down your website and try to basically shut down your research that was going to challenge Darwinian evolution? Well, it's... um it's resulted in a number of speaking engagements. I, I got very popular. I've increased my visibility of my work, and more people are probably aware of my work than ever before. Is that right? So you have certainly seen some positives coming out of, of what happened to you. Well, if you call visibility, good, yes. Well, three of the pro-ID papers on your censured website have now been published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, and the first IEEE paper co-authored with William Dembski established the basics of evolutionary informatics. We actually covered that paper on the Idea of the Future podcast with Dr. Dembski a few months ago, but you now have two additional papers published by you and Bill Dembski and another one with you and Dembski and Winston Ewart. And one of them is on Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reasoning applied to evolutionary computing. I believe the exact title of the paper is Bernoulli's Principle of Insufficient Reason and Conservation of Information in Computer Search, published in the 2009 Proceedings of the IEEE Conference on Systems Man and Cybernetics. So, looking at the title of your paper that we're talking about today, what exactly is Bernoulli's Principle of Insufficient Reason? Well, there is a Bernoulli's principle in fluid dynamics, and it's not the same one. Jacob Bernoulli was a member of the Bernoulli family of mathematicians and scientists. There were a whole bunch of them doing great and wonderful things. He proposed Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason early in the 18th century, and it has become kind of the foundation of classic probability. And basically says if we know nothing about outcomes, we assume equal probabilities. We use it every day. If you roll a die, your chance of getting two dots in the die is one out of six. Uh, 
if there's 10 million lottery tickets sold and you buy one, your chances of winning is one in 10 million. And so it's something which is applied ubiquitously in our everyday reasoning. Bill Dimsky and I address Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason as it applies to software simulation of evolution. And we use it to demonstrate that all computer models of evolution uh, that we have analyzed indeed do smuggle in active information to assure success. And due to the uh, model that we established in the first paper, that you mentioned, we can actually measure the amount of that information in bits. Now, I took AP economics in high school, and John Maynard Keynes was the guy who inspired these great government bailouts back when a million dollars was still a whole lot of money. That was a long time ago, but what would John Maynard Keynes say about Bernoulli's principle and why, and do you think he's right? Well, we discussed this in the paper. Uh, Keynes criticized Bernoulli's principle, and no, he's, uh, he's not right. One of the objections he raised was something called Bertrand's Paradox, and uh, I treat Bertrand's Paradox in my book, Handbook of Fourier Analysis and Its Application, published by Oxford University Press, 2009, and uh, the details are in there. But basically, what Bertrand's Paradox does is it chooses a line at random and draws it through a circle and asks, what is the probability that the cord within the circle exceeds a certain length? And uh, if you analyze it different ways, you get different answers. And Keynes actually said this was a problem with Bernoulli's principle, and it isn't, uh, as we discuss in the book. It's a problem of, of the definition of random that is used. It's not a failure of Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason that I can see, but I also can't see the reasoning behind Keynesian economics either. So. so we've got this debate about whether information is conserved in searches and whether you can improve your ability to search or whether you can basically derive information about a search target without actually knowing anything about where it is. This latter approach is what you guys might call getting a free lunch. How is any of this relevant to the debate over Darwinian evolution of living organisms? Well, I can speak only with authority on computer simulations of Darwinian evolution, such as uh, Avida and EV. It's said that a mature science, such as evolution, should be modeled with mathematics. And I believe that Avida and EV are attempts to indeed do that. All of the computer programs, though purporting to demonstrate Darwinian evolution, of which I'm aware, are written to succeed. They're written to do exactly what they do. And contrary to my understanding also of Darwinian evolution, they are teleological. They all have a target in mind that they are uh, searching for. A colleague of mine here at Baylor, also on the faculty here at Baylor, one of the pioneers of intelligent design also, uh, Walter Bradley, has a wonderful analogy. He says that programs to demonstrate Darwinian evolution are akin to a pinball machine. The steel ball, it kind of bounces around differently every time, but eventually ends up falling down the little hole behind the flippers. And I think that this is a wonderful definition or a wonderful, uh, a wonderful metaphor describing the way that these uh, programs work. Your paper contains a very interesting passage that I'd like to read briefly. It says, quote, In most cases, the controversy over conservation of information can be traced to the interpretation and understanding of Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason, a concept that can be muddied by what may be called familiarity zones. Like comfort zones, familiarity zones can become so ingrained that we take them for granted, things that we have no right to take for granted. The absence of any prior knowledge for, required for uniformity conceptually parallels the difficulty of understanding the nothing that physics says existed before the Big Bang. It's common to picture the universe before the Big Bang as a large black void in empty space. No, this is a flawed image. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing. A large black void of empty space is something. So space must be purged from our visualization. Our next impulse is then mistakenly to say there was nothing, then all of a sudden, but no, that doesn't work either. All of a sudden presupposes there was time, and modern cosmology says that time in our universe was also created at the Big Bang. The, nothing, the concept of nothing must exclude conditions involving time and space. Nothing is conceptually difficult because the idea is so divorced from our experience and familiarity zones. Unquote. So what exactly are you saying here, Dr. Marx, that we have to reimagine what we mean by absence of any prior knowledge about a search target? My point is, is that I'm unable to comprehend the idea of no time and no space as dictated by physics. I think that some people have similar problems envisioning the nothing that is required in the application of Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reasoning. It's difficult to think outside experience 
and your own entrenched paradigms. Many of the criticisms of the no free lunch theorem and conservation of information say that Bernoulli's principle does not apply. There have been publications to this effect. They say there is a structure in the search space, or maybe that nature is just not like that. But uh, actually, these criticisms, even if they're true, they solve nothing. They actually take the problem to a different level. It's a regress, because we then need to ask ourselves, where did the structure in the search space come from? And based on some ideas uh, that Bill Dembski has, we're actually putting forth a paper where we look at the search for the search and look how difficult it is to actually generate one of these search spaces that generates meaningful outcomes. So the analogy is, back with the pinball machines, that it's a lot easier to play pinball than it is to make the pinball machine. In fact, we show it increases in difficulty exponentially. Do you think that theorists sometimes smuggle in active information into their programs without realizing they've done that? Yeah, your, your point is, is absolutely true. Uh, scientific history is, is replete with inaccurate predictions from the luminaries of entrenched paradigms. And this comes from all sides. It, becomes, it comes from science, it comes from religion, it comes from uh, all points. Around the turn of the century, the great experimentalist Albert Michelson uh, said something kind of profound. Michelson is best known for the Michelson-Morley experiment, where he showed that the speed of light was a constant, which Einstein to come up with uh, relativity. Michelson said science was finished discovering anything new. All was done was done. All that we need to do is increase the accuracy to a greater number of digits. And then this was before relativity and quantum mechanics. So the question is, is why should we assume that models today are without error? I think it's presumptuous to think that indeed this is the case. Dr. Marks, do some people mistakenly attribute the success of their research to some kind of a magic bullet logic inherent in their search engine, when in reality the success of their search is actually due to their prior knowledge about the search space or the target location? Computer programs, including all of the models of Darwinian evolution of which I am aware, perform the way their programmers intended. Doing so requires that the programmer uh, infuse information about the program's goal. You can't write a good program without it. So do you believe in magic, Dr. Marks? Uh, in magic? Um, if you mean kind of the uncaused occurrence of an event with teeny, teeny probability of occurring, uh, the answer is no. I, in the graduate course I teach for engineering probability and, and noise, I tell my students that their chances of winning the lottery are about the same whether or not they buy a ticket. And I tell them that it's probably better that they give their money to me and I'll decide whether to give it back or not. Because many, winning in the lottery would be almost like magic, as you're talking about. <laughs> What about Darwinism? Do you think that Darwinism requires or at least relies on a little bit of magic here and there sometimes? Well, from the viewpoint of computer simulation, our universe, as we know it, does not contain the probabilistic resources to get a meaningful result for even a moderately sized unassisted search. In fact... If you take 10 to the 1,000th of our universes and what's referred to sometimes as the multiverse, the probability resources don't exist there either. So what do you say to folks out there who claim that proponents of intelligent design don't do scientific research? I mean, is the universe going to explode if you guys continue to do this <laughs> research? Because uh, this is not supposed to be happening. Well, I, I would say, first of all, if you ask me what I'm going to say, I would, I would tell people let's abandon labels and begin to pursue the truth no matter where it leads. And advice to me, too, is don't entrench yourself in your paradigm and claim any sort of corner on truth. Many who do so in history are shown to be quite foolish. If there is a designer, be it the God of Christianity or directed panspermia, then that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. Don't be like the astronomer Arthur Eddington, who found that the Big Bang was repugnant to him because it suggested a creator. Eddington's ideology was an obstacle to him seeing the truth. So tell us a little about the IEEE that published your paper. I mean, is this some backwater creationist museum off Highway 62 in central Timbuktu? Or, or what is the IEEE, and are they a legitimate organization? Because people always get suspicious, you know, when these papers come out that may actually challenge Darwinian evolution. 
Well, they're not in Timbuktu. They're in uh, Piscataway, New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, IEEE, which is an acronym for the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, is a great organization. I've been a member of the organization for 40 years. I'm a fellow of the IEEE. It turns out it's the largest professional society in the world. It has over 375,000 members. Well, Dr. Marks, I really want to just congratulate you again on getting these papers published and the great work and the research that you guys are doing at the Evolutionary Informatics. Lab. I want to remind our listeners that they can visit the Evolutionary Informatics Lab website at evoinfo.org. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Dr. Marx's opinions that he expresses on this podcast are, of course, his alone and don't necessarily represent those of his employers. So hope that's an okay disclaimer for you. I'm Casey Luskin for the ID of the Future podcast. Don't let anyone tell you that ID proponents aren't doing research. Thanks for listening. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2010. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.